Oh boy, it's Strix Motherboard Review Time, the ROG Strix Z690F Gaming Wi-Fi. With bonus, why did they return it to Micro Center minigame? Let's take a look. So this is the ROG Strix Z690F Gaming Wi-Fi. As I said, it's 16 plus one power stages, support for PCI Express 4.0 M.2, and it's got a really cool slot release for GPUs. There's a lot to like. When you buy an ASUS motherboard, you can go all out. You can get a really expensive motherboard, but usually if you want, you know, the best bang for the buck, but you still want the gamer features, the Strix, the Strix is where it's at. And that's why it's one of the most popular models at Micro Center. This one was about $70 off. Why was this $70 off? Now this, this is a chonker of an ATX motherboard. Uh, there is no rear metal backplate or rear anything with the VRMs or anything like that, but there are two large metal heat sinks connected by heat pipe on the corner. This is a 16 plus one power delivery system. So, you know, the 12900K that Intel mega juiced 241 watts, this motherboard can run it. Alder Lake power usage is actually a story in and of itself. If I might digress for just a moment, the uh, power usage levels of the 12900K are a little bit overstated as far as gamers are concerned. In fact, my initial review, I said, oh boy, it loves to drink the power. And for multi-core workloads, things like Blender and Cinebench and rendering and things like that, Oh boy, it loves to drink the power. There's also anomalous things that happen when you're playing games. So like take for example, Tomb Raider. When you're playing Tomb Raider with a high-end GPU at something like 1080p, on the 11900K, when the game is busy doing something with the GPU and the CPU doesn't have a lot to do, the CPU doesn't consume a lot of power. On most Z690 motherboards, the 12900K continues to consume a lot of power, making a lot of heat and other unpleasantness that you have to deal with. And so if you just really quickly look at that, it looks like the CPU is using a lot of power relative to the prior generation, even though technically the 11900K could also consume 241 watts in PL2. It's a confusing and nuanced situation. The reality is if you step down to something like the 12700K, the number of FPS per watt that you get is actually comparable to the competing platform. It's, it's pretty close. Uh, win some, lose some, depends on motherboard particulars, motherboard efficiency, and some other variables that we'll get into. It also makes a pretty big difference depending on if you're using the 6900 XT from Team Red, as opposed to something like the 3080 Ti or 3090 from Team Green. It's a really odd situation, but this is a motherboard review, and we're focused on the ROG Strix Z690F gaming Wi-Fi. The PCIe layout. The PCIe layout on this motherboard, for this price point, I would have liked a better PCIe layout. We have our primary X16 slot, which is PCI Express 5.0, directly into the CPU. All of our other PCIe slots are connected to the chipset. Now the chipset has a PCI Express by eight link from the CPU to the chipset. Okay, technically it's a PCI Express 4.0 by eight equivalent, the DMI link, but eight PCI Express four lanes of bandwidth is a lot of bandwidth from your CPU to a chipset. We do have a PCI Express by eight slot at the bottom. We have two PCI Express 3.0 M.2s back to back here. One PCI Express 4 slot here connected to the chipset. And then our PCI Express 4 slot here just below the CPU that is connected directly to the CPU. So that is a total of four M.2s on this board. Two PCI Express 4, two PCI Express 3. That's a pretty good amount of PCI connectivity for this desktop platform. This is a DDR5 motherboard, and I tested it with Kingston Fury memory, running at 5200, because OMG. But getting your hands on DDR5 is really not a lot of fun right now. The M.2 cooling is pretty good as well. The one below the CPU is hooked up so that you've got a heatsink above and below the M.2, so it's gonna pull heat away from the top and the bottom of the M.2. It's a nice touch. So this motherboard has a total of eight four pin fan headers, two at the top edge of the motherboard, two just below the CPU socket, one in the bottom corner of the motherboard, three along the bottom, and that's eight. In terms of front panel USB connections, there's one 30 pin connector and there's one type C connector. The front panel USB-C header is a type C header for a two by two configuration. That is 20 gigabit. And if your case supports a 20 gigabit USB front panel type C, well, there you go. You can use it with this motherboard. In addition, there are also two more USB 2.0 ports at the bottom. So that gives you a total of four usable USB 2.0 ports 
for any other peripherals that you might have, such as water cooling or whatever, that might want an internal USB 2.0 header. In terms of power delivery, we have two standard 8-pin power connectors, ATX at the top edge of the motherboard. With Alder Lake, I mean, even as crazy as it is, you really only need one of those, but hey, there's two here, just in case. Also got our 24-pin ATX power connector at the front edge of the motherboard. Nothing unexpected there. In terms of other connectors I haven't covered, well, of course, at the bottom, you've got your front panel connection and your front panel audio, but there's an additional temperature sensor, T sensor, right here on the front edge, which will give you an extra analog temperature sensor that you can put in your case and have your fans or the rest of your system react depending on what you're looking for. The motherboard also has six, six gigabit per second SATA ports. Some of those resources are shared with other resources on the board. You're gonna to wanna to double check the manual to know which ports are shared with what connectors in order to make decisions about which thing goes where. You've also got this Velcro cable retention thing, which is kind of a lot of fun. If you're noticing the CPU socket on this motherboard has moved a little bit more toward the front edge of the motherboard than I'm used to, but that's because the VRM cooling area is uh, so large. Look at this. So much room for VRM. In terms of rear I.O., we have DisplayPort and HDMI out. That is for the onboard iGPU solution. We have two USB 2.0, including a BIOS flashback solution. We've got four USB 5 gigabit ports, two USB Type-A 10 gigabit ports, two USB Type-C ports, one 20 gig, one 10 gig. We've got our 2.5 gig NIC. The 2.5 gig NIC is an Intel i225V. Uh, it is an Intel wireless uh, Wi-Fi 6E solution plus the Intel 225V NIC. It's pretty awesome. Then we've got our Supreme FX Audio 7.1 with optical SPDIF out. Overall, in terms of the board and the aesthetic and everything else, I think Asus has done a pretty good job putting this together. I think the PCIe layout could have been a little bit better, but I really like the release button for the GPU. That's really innovative, especially if you change your GPU a lot or you need to pop things in and out of the system. It's a great feature for somebody like me. For you, I don't know. How often are you changing your GPU? Now for the return, the mini game. I was hinting about it. Did you figure out why it was returned? Well, this motherboard out of the box had BIOS version 0407. BIOS version 0407 I don't think was ever meant to see the light of day. There weren't even any XMP options or DOCP options or anything to do with memory tuning. Basically, it's a will it boot situation. Fortunately, Asus had some more up-to-date BIOSes on their website. In fact, 0407 is so old that it's not on the Asus website. How crazy is that? Maybe Micro Center was expected to update these before selling them to customers. I don't know. But yeah, I have a feeling that somebody bought this motherboard, put their CPU in it, maybe they were able to get some DDR5 RAM and nothing because there was nothing wrong with the motherboard and I did not have to RMA it, but I did save a few bucks off the cost of the, the motherboard because of the yellow tag from Micro Center. Now in terms of other BIOS features, you go through this, it's a pretty standard ASUS BIOS. Everything is pretty much working as expected and Alder Lake performance, performance cores, efficiency cores, all that stuff is here. If you disable your efficiency cores, you do get AVX 512, the instruction set, if that's important to you. Mostly I'm gonna say no, unless you already, you know, are read in on those kind of things. It doesn't really matter too much. If you're trying to make a decision between an i5, i7, i9, there's no gaming performance difference, not really, between the i7 and the i9, so you can save a couple of hundred bucks and get the i7. Really, you only lose four efficiency cores, and Windows 11 goes out of its way to make sure that you're not using those efficiency cores for gaming anyway. So really, have you lost much? The i5 is also a little bit bananas, the 12600K. Six performance cores and four efficiency cores, 10 cores total. 10 cores on an i5, that's, that's crazy. And also around $300, a little bit less, a little bit more depending on, on where you are. There's some other i5 CPUs that are coming if they're not already out by the time this video is out that I'm gonna take a look at. But this motherboard might be overkill if you're going for something like an i5. The power delivery circuitry here is really designed for the i9 and even overclocking. Now in terms of Linux support, Linux support is actually really weird right now. So these Alder Lake CPUs use an extension of Turbo Boost Max 3.0, the way that was implemented in the Linux kernel. So there's bugs. If you have an i5, because historically the i5 had not supported Turbo Boost Max 3.0, you're gonna have a bad time. The Asus BIOS actually does work with Linux to do the scheduling hints correctly. So there's a, there's a structure that's in proc. You can check out the level one forum. You can come there. There's a couple threads that describe this. But in a nutshell, if you disable XMP, this motherboard will correctly report the hints that are necessary for the scheduler in Linux to make decisions about scheduling on P cores, E cores, and hyper-threaded cores. If you enable XMP, at least as of the 1129 BIOS for this motherboard, all of the CPUs are treated equally, including the hyper-threaded cores, which seems like a mistake. So Linux on Alder Lake in general 
is a bit weird. The i225V is reasonably well supported on Linux. Sometimes you get an error like minus 19 because it has trouble loading the driver and that's a whole other dimension of crazy that you have to deal with. But the Supreme FX, which is, you know, really a Realtek chipset, uh, is pretty well supported on Linux and all of the other onboard features for this motherboard pretty well supported in Linux. You can configure your fans through the BIOS so that you don't have to worry too much about that kind of thing in Linux. But for Linux specific stuff, you can check out the Linux channel and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Overall, it's a good motherboard. Asus is a pretty good brand. They're, they like to think they're the best. Uh, it's a pretty well put together motherboard. If you're doing a gaming build, you really wouldn't go wrong picking this motherboard. There's not really anything that dramatically sets it apart. Uh, if anything, for the standard issue price tag of $399, uh, you might be able to get a little bit more features, a little bit better deal, but the motherboard is really well put together for what you get, especially in terms of power delivery and the DDR5 memory aspect of it and overclocking. If you're looking for the best bang for your buck, I think DDR4 right now with a less expensive motherboard for Alder Lake with the i7 overall is the best bang for your buck. But if you're looking for a higher end system with an i9 and DDR5, it's a pretty good choice. I'm Modo, this is Level 1, I'm signing out. You can find me in the Level 1 forums.